Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to have you back here for another lectionary Bible study for this third Sunday after Epiphany. Today's texts are going to be from Jonah chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and Mark chapter 1. The theme for this Sunday is going to be about the urgency of mission. And so what we're going to see in in all three texts is this idea of not only the mission of the church and the proclamation of repentance uh, and belief and faith in God, but it's also going to be um, sort of surrounded by this notion of of immediacy and urgency and need to get going due to Christ's eschatological or end times appearance. And so what I mean by that is Because Christ coming in our flesh and being incarnate and beginning his mission to the world means that the last days have now begun. And because the last days have now begun, there is an urgency that wasn't present prior to his arrival. And that's not to say that there isn't a general urgency for all those who may... um, who may die at any moment or something like that. Um, But it's to recognize that now that Christ has come, died on the cross, risen from the grave, there is a at any moment for all the world, Uh, not just those who might be terminally ill or something like that, or even recognizing that at any moment there could be a car accident and and you could die. Um, But there's an urgency for all people in all situations that at any moment Christ could return and time is up. And that sort of urgency has, its, has effects on us as Christians and us as the church. And, that, and so we start to see that urgency in these texts, especially in regards to the mission of the church. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to look at Jonah chapter 3 first. And this text is right in the middle of Jonah. So if you are not familiar with the story of Jonah, Uh, You have chapter 1 in which Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, which is an enemy city, and tell the people to repent. And Jonah doesn't want to go. And so he goes from uh, from Israel, jumps on a boat, sails the Mediterranean, and it seems like for most commentators, he's headed to Spain. He's going to go to Spain. He's going to go in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. Then um, the, the, the boat encounters a storm. Uh, they cast lots to find out whose fault this storm is. The lots fall upon Jonah. They cast him over the boat. Um, and then Jonah goes down into the depths um, and then is rescued by a great fish who swallows him. Um, and in this uh, great fish, um, and to use a little bit of imagery that we see also in Uh, later on in in the New Testament, this tomb of the great fish um, where he he sort of rests for a few days, three to be exact. Um, He then, in chapter two, writes this this poem of of faith and repentance and uh, recognizing God um, and and sort of confessing his sin and, and looking to God to rescue him. So then, um, at the end of chapter 2, the fish vomits Jonah back up onto dry land. And and then we jump into chapter 3 where um, Jonah is once again called to the task that he was told to do in chapter 1, almost verbatim. Um, And so we're going to look at that and then we're going to see a little bit of the context and talk a little bit about what uh, this text means, means for us. So let's go ahead and jump over to this. Okay, so chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, and then verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, 
And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Okay, so what are some key, key things going on here? Now, as I mentioned um, in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against, them, against it the message that I tell you. This is basically exactly what was said in chapter 1. So God has not changed his message or his task, even after uh, Jonah ran away, got swallowed by a fish, and then vomited back up. So God's will here is unchanging for Nineveh, and all of Jonah's actions had no effect on what God wanted done. Uh, and did not stop the other, I mean, the other part of this is Jonah's sins against God did not stop God from using Jonah as his messenger. Um, so there is this forgiveness aspect and in, in continued use for Jonah even after uh, he has done this terrible thing. And then we find out a little bit about Nineveh, uh, that it's an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth is how it's translated here. Um, and the problem is, we don't, I don't know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a specific measurement. Um, are we talking about the territory controlled by Nineveh? Are we talking about the suburbs? Are we talking about the city walls? Um, and what does it mean to be three days journey in breadth? And my highlighter is shot. All right. I think I knew that one. This one is garbage. I'm supposed to use the other one. Um, There we go. Um, so three days journey in breadth. Um, does that mean from east to west, north to south? Does that is that circumference? Um, and how exactly how long is a three days journey in distance? Um, so all these sort of things are sort of difficult to sort out, especially since we in general know where Nineveh is and its ruins and how big it was. Um, so I, it doesn't really matter because what's going to happen is Jonah's going to go into the city a portion of the way um, and, and then he does his, then he does his message. So then we see what the message of the Lord is that God has given to Jonah. In 40 days, you're going to be overthrown. That's it. That's all the message we're given from Jonah. This isn't a big, long sermon. There's no call to repentance, no call to believe in Yahweh, no call to believe uh, that Jonah is a legitimate prophet. He comes, he speaks, one sentence, 40 days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And of course, the people understand what that means. Um, and yet, what happens in verse 5? The people of Nineveh believed God. That, that's it. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them, and then we get the little ellipsis here. And what's, middle, what's left out between uh, verse 6 and 9, which I don't, I don't know why they left it out. I don't know why they couldn't just put the three verses in so you get the whole story. Um, but the king finds out. So the king of Nineveh finds out that of what Jonah's message is, and he institutes a nationwide fast. So all the people of Nineveh and the king who represents the people all believe God's message, um, and they all repent. And they all sort of um, have this moment of reflection, and, and then when God saw what they did, and so this, I mean, Ten's obviously the important part here, uh, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Um, so, there's... I, 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 everybody kind of repents, and God notices it, and 
he doesn't do what he promised to do. There are, um, there are some commentators, um, some theologians, who think that this is the end of the book of Jonah. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, there's a chapter 4, isn't there? Um, and they think that 4 is an addendum. There's no reason to really think that except, you know, it can. In a sense, if you read the rest of verse 10, or you read all of verse 10, you don't need to have anything else said. Um, the people repented. God didn't do it. The end could easily go right there. And so um, when people say that, it's the question then ask is, well, why is chapter 4 added? And if you go to look at chapter 4, what you'll find is Jonah is not happy that God didn't burn down the city. Um, and Jonah then has to have this final lesson about whether or not he, as the prophet and voice of God, should be happy when people are spared death and destruction. Um, which is a lesson for us as well, which isn't the lesson for this week. Um, but sometimes people aren't happy that certain people hear the good news of the gospel. Uh, whether that be people of a certain race, certain class, certain ideology, um, certain location, whatever it might be, we as people have enemies. And as though, even though Jesus tells us we should love our enemies, we aren't particularly enthralled when our enemies uh, become brothers and sisters. And so that's, that's sort of the lesson of chapter 4, which is not the lesson here. Uh, here, what we find in chapter 3 is a couple of different major points to, to focus on. One, God still uses broken people to proclaim his message. That's uh, the whole story of Jonah in a sense, in a nutshell. Uh, that God calls all people to repentance, even the enemies of God, which all of us have been and are at times when we rebel against him. And then we have the final point, which... Um, I have made note of in a sermon past, and I only know that I've done this in a sermon past because Betsy still remembers the phrase, and it's an important phrase. Uh, it's the nakam in the nifal. So nakam is a Hebrew verb, and nifal is the form of the verb. Um, and what that means is, is changing your mind or changing a verdict. And this is, you know, it's a normal thing to say, oh, I changed my mind, except it's unique when God's the subject of the verb. So what we find in Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 is that God changes his mind or changes the verdict that he had already spoken. So if you look over here, um, God said 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. That's not a, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, this is what God says, 40 days, overthrown. End of sentence. Yet, and we see the yet here, uh, but that's not serving the same point. Uh, yet what we find in verse 10, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This has major theological implications. And it has major theological implications because the way we often visualize God, when we think about God, we think unchanging. Or the technical term, immutable. God is unchanging and immutable. Uh, so his will does not change. His character does not change. Um, he's also omniscient and especially toward the future. So he has future knowledge. And he is truthful 
So he can't lie. Okay. So we have these three things. And these are generally scriptural principles and principles uh, in which all people sort of recognize that God, it, to be God, he has to be unchanging, omniscient, and truthful. So, here's the question. Did God lie through the prophet Jonah? Forty days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Forty days came and went, wasn't overthrown. Did God lie? Or did God not know the future? Or did God change when he is unchanging? So when we see this idea of God relenting, there is a little bit of theological wrestling that has to be done because our typical notions of God come into a tension when we see that God changes his verdict or changes his mind or relents. And so, on one hand, we have this God, and on the other hand, we have a different God who listens, changes his mind, Um, and so, and I guess we could throw in here, is incarnate, as in he has our flesh. Um, or in, in a better way to see the, the uh, conflict, he's in time. So, we have both of these depictions that seem to be contradictory in that if God listens, and this is uh, what I mean by that is to prayer, he can change his mind, he can relent, um, change his verdict, and he comes in the person of Jesus Christ and he lives in time in which things change constantly. Both Jesus changes, um, and thus God experiences that change uh, while he exists in time and in creation. So, you have this tension between, and I'm going to, there's obviously only one God, we're going to confess that, but there's these two gods, these two things that seem, these two, these two sets of characteristics that seem at odds with each other uh, when we confess them. And so what do we do with these two different gods? Um, and the answer is we hold both of them in tension. Um, and we just acknowledge that both are true sets of characteristics for God. And the way we do this theologically is by calling, and this is something that Luther does, uh, one is called the hidden God and one is called the revealed God. So when we look at our list over here, um, this is the God that is hidden, as in hidden from our own understanding. We don't understand how God can be all three of these things, um, and we can't approach this God, and we can't, there's, there's no sort of like, oh yeah, I get how God knows everything. No, you don't. Uh, if you think you do, you don't. Um, this whole idea of being omniscient uh, is a uh, unfathomable kind of proposition to put forward. Uh, it's true, but we don't really fathom how it's true. In the same way here, we have God revealed. This is the God we find in Scripture. In Scripture, we find a God who listens to our prayers, that changes his mind, can be in time. Uh, but we also recognize uh, this nature of him as well. And so the revealed God uh, is the God that we worship and adore and speak about. And the hidden God is the God that we fear. Um, and so I was talking uh, to Steve about this earlier last week about how um, the God that whom we are afraid of is this God, the God who is hidden, the God who's 
judgments and knowledge are unfathomable to us, but the God whom we love and worship and adore um, is the God who is revealed to us in Scripture. Um, and so there are many who only know the hidden God and therefore fear and hate him uh, because of his unknowableness. Uh, but those who have see the revealed God uh, come to him in love and worship because he is one who, who pays attention and listens and cha can change his mind and, and is with us in our suffering um, and understands that, among with other things. But, um, so here is how, so when we look at Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, and we see God relenting and we see this Nakam in the Nifal, uh, it brings about this idea that we have to recognize and how God can change his mind and listens to prayer. And so this is one of those important things when we talk about prayer, whether it be prayer for healing, prayer for our country, prayer for whatever needs that we seem, that seem impossible, uh, we can appeal to the revealed God that he has revealed, that he listens to our prayer, that he has given us promises, um, and that he has the ability to do it. And so we can sort of hold those promises towards God. Uh, and he might relent. He might change his mind. And so recognizing this, we recognize that there is power in prayer. If we don't have this nakam in the nifal concept, what we're left with is prayer serving the function of changing us instead of changing God. So if God can't change his mind, then when we pray to him, what we're doing is we're shaping ourselves and it's an act of our own piety. And so when we send up a prayer to God, he, in a sense, just sends back our own um, a reshaping of our own desires to his will, um, which in some regards, yes, that is what we're doing in that God is shaping us uh, to be more in line with his will through our prayers, that we are submitting ourselves to his will, um, and that's the humility of our prayers. But we also, as Christians, uh, can appeal to this idea that God listens and can change his mind about things. Um, and so uh, that's an important part of prayer, to know that even though God knows everything, even though God has decided all things ahead of time, and though God is truthful in his, what he commands uh, and says, he can also change his mind. And that alone sort of gives us a God um, whom we can appeal to in our own truthfulness. Um, you know, saying or praying to a God we know doesn't really listen or change his mind um, seems like a futile exercise uh, of, of personal, um, personal piety. Um, when in fact, our prayers can have this this emotional substance of knowing that something truly can come of it um, and that we can plead to someone who hears and can do something about it. Um, so anyway, those are some of the, the big theological ideas of Jonah chapter 3. Turning our attention then uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we have this text here which um, is going to require a little bit of... Um, context as well. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 29 to 35. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried man, or the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Okay. So when we hear this text, one of the first things we're going to think about is, um, does Paul want us to be married or not married? And the answer is yes. 
Um, for those whom, um, well, let's back up for a minute because that's really the wrong question to ask of the text, but it's the first question you think of when you hear the text is, was it sinful for me to be married or not sinful for me to be married? And that's not the first thing we have to address because you have to understand where Paul's coming from here. Um, and what Paul is saying first is, look, the time has grown very short. Um, so that's the key first idea here. Uh, and sets the stage for everything else that he's saying. Um, the appointed time has grown short. In other words, God can come back at any moment, and we have to sort of live with that reality. And so what should that reality look like? Well, it should look like we care a lot about what's going to happen next and not so much about the present. Uh, and I've talked about this a lot of times on these videos talking about how we are future oriented people and the future that we're oriented to is the new heavens and the new earth, not just, um, you know, life in our 60s and 70s and 80s and sort of looking toward that or, uh, you know, being investment minded or something or, or even looking, you know, 50 years ahead into the future for our kids and grandkids. Uh, that's not future oriented. Uh, what we mean as Christians as being future-oriented is having our eyes set on the realities of the new heavens and new earth and living for those realities uh, and not, um, not being short-sighted. And so if that is the case, if that's who we are, because we know the time has grown short, uh, we'll live in such a way that the things of the present will have little effect on our lives. Um, and so if you experience death, you won't mourn for very long. Um, if uh, you experience great celebration, you won't celebrate for long. It's of no uh, consequence. Uh, if you have to buy things, uh, you live as if you don't have many things. Um, if you have to deal with the world, you deal with it as if it's passing away. Um, and so what this, what this does is it sort of encourages us in our, when we're, when we're looking, when we are looking toward the future, we have to then understand our present in a different way. Um, so if we're going to be living future oriented, then that future informs our present, as I've drawn this before. Uh, and so what does this informing look like? Well, it informs that the present is less than the future, um, but still important, right? So I didn't say it's not important, it's less than. Um, and that's the hard part, uh, is we don't wanna go too far in one direction. We don't wanna be so future-oriented that like the Corinthians, they just stopped working. Um, that, hey, uh, if the, Jesus is going to come back soon, then I'm not going to keep working at my job. I hate it. Uh, I'm just going to sit here, retire, and the church can help care for me because I'm so future-oriented uh, that I don't have to worry about the present. So you can go too far in that direction. And you can be too focused on the present, obviously, um, and not care about the future at all. So Paul's wanting us to live in this tension and what the result is, is that we can be free from our present anxieties. Um, the result of all of this up here is that we can be free from anxieties if we keep things in the right perspective. And he, so then he uses the example of marriage as where anxiety can come from. Uh, an unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. He doesn't have to worry about his wife, uh, his kids. And... You know, in some regards, I haven't spoke. I've, so one of one of my friends uh, in Iowa uh, was somewhat recently married uh, in the last few years, uh, but he did spend three or four years in the ministry without being married. Um, and I could see, I saw this at seminary as well. Um, you know, the guys who were unmarried and living in the dorms um, read more. They they did more. They did their, most of them could do their homework without uh, much trouble because what else did they have to do? Um, they didn't have to worry about, um, you know, 
their wife and kids. Um, the married guys, you know, I was married to Cammy at the time. Um, the married guys seemed to be, uh, they, they had to work harder to get the same things done uh, because they had other priorities surrounding them. Um, you know, they couldn't wait till eight o'clock to have dinner because they were reading a book for, you know, some professor. Uh, the kids were hungry at 5.30. Well, they were hungry probably at 4. Uh, but, you know, mom's been pushing off the dinner until, you know, until it's ready. Um, and so, you know, he has to stop what he's doing and, and he has to take care of the kids and he has to have dinner with his wife. And, you know, these things sort of get in the way um, of the pursuit of, you know, of whatever it might be. Now, of course, married men and married women make this choice, and it's worth that to them because of the love and the family and the responsibilities. And, you know, these things are, are, are worthwhile and worth having. Uh, Paul is not denying that. Um, what Paul is saying is that there is a distinction. Um, the single guys don't have these worries. The single women don't have these worries and these anxieties. Uh, it's easier for them to look purely toward the future in the right way because they don't have to sort of turn back their head to see this pr these present responsibilities and these present anxieties. So um, is a pastor without a family uh, serving the Lord better than a pastor with a family? Probably not, and it's really not a necessarily distinction here, but what probably is happening isn't necessarily a difference in quality, but maybe a difference in time, for example. Um, you know, if I work an 80-hour week, I'm going to miss seeing my kids and my wife. Um, but if a single guy works 80 hours a week, who, who is missing him at home? You know, maybe the, the dog. Um, <clears throat> and that's really about it. So uh, if the, the guy <clears throat> who doesn't have these anxieties is serving the Lord and doing it well, uh, he can do, in a sense, more of it. Um, and that's sort of what Paul is going to get after in if we continue on with chapter seven, it past this text is uh, he's going to sort of sort this out. Like it doesn't, it, if you can go your whole life without needing to be married, go ahead. Uh, if you can't, then go ahead and get married. Uh, it doesn't really make, the difference isn't huge. God will continue to use people regardless, which we saw in Jonah chapter three. Um, so if God can use Jonah, who he had to swallow with a fish and vomit back out, he can probably use somebody who's married. Uh, especially when we think that more than likely Peter was married. So uh, it's not, it's, there's no abolition against priests being married or one being better than the other. Uh, same for singleness, and this is one of the things the church often ignores. Single people have a purpose too. Uh, those who are unmarried, uh, they, they are lifted up as valuable to those who can dedicate time uh, to the work of the church and to its mission. Uh, so, uh, anyway, that's, that's uh, what's going on here in, in sort of that part. Uh, but when we're looking, so when we're thinking about 1 Corinthians 7, one of the things I said was it's talking about the urgency of the mission. And this text kind of points to that urgency that, you know, the time is short and therefore we need to evaluate how we spend our time and how we, um, what we're anxious about. Because if we're going to be worrying about all these other things in the present, we're never going to get around to the future orientation that God is calling us to, to have. And so uh, this is where that urgency starts to sort of take form and take shape uh, in this theme of the text. Uh, we saw a little bit of the urgency with Jonah that, you know, it's time to go, you got to get moving. Um, and we're going to see that in, in the gospel reading in just a minute. But here in Corinthians, we see Paul literally say the time is running short. Uh, it's time to get going. It's time to move. Uh, so <clears throat> we see that here in, in this text. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to the gospel reading and uh, we'll see what's, what's happening there. So Mark 1, 14 to 20. <clears throat> After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. 
and immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with, hired, with the hired servants and followed him. Okay. So there's two sections to this text. Um, and it's right here. Here's the division. 14 and 15 are one thing. 16 to 20 are another. Um, in 14 and 15, we see the inauguration of Jesus' ministry. And it is set up by John the Baptist being arrested. And so why, why was John the Baptist arrested? Well, he was preaching against Herod and his incestuous relationship with his wife. Um, now, not incestuous in the, time, in the term that we, well, maybe a little. I was going to say it's not quite the same way, but I'm pretty sure um, Herodias is maybe a sister from a different mother. Um, but he, the real problem for John the Baptist was that um, Herodias was the, wife of his still living brother um, and so for a time his wife was his sister-in-law uh, and now she is his wife and his brother did not die uh, but divorced her and so it's it's a whole family drama thing that john the baptist is calling out herod for because this is not the way the king of israel should behave um, and so john was arrested because herod got tired of hearing John the Baptist preach against him. And so then Jesus comes onto the scene after, after John's arrested. And where does he go? Well, he goes to Galilee. Well, what's Galilee? Galilee is the territory ruled by Herod. And so in some ways, we can sort of see this as Jesus taking a stand against Herod um, and not backing down from uh, John being arrested. So John gets arrested. Uh, Herod thinks his message has now been stopped because he's in prison. And what happens next? Jesus shows up and he preaches the exact same message that John the Baptist was saying to his people. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see this more uh, specifically in Matthew's gospel where, we, uh, where Jesus' sermon, is, the first words Jesus says as an adult in his ministry are the exact same words that John the Baptist had said uh, in, in, earlier on in the, in the chapter. And so Jesus takes the place of John the Baptist in the same way here, uh, that he goes to the same territory uh, where Herod's in charge and where John the Baptist was preaching, and he sort of just steps right in and says, this message will continue, uh, you can, and what are you going to do about it um, in some ways? You can kind of take that. Um, you don't have to kind of see that as that way, that sort of Jesus is coming in, stepping in, sort of boldly proclaiming what John the Baptist proclaimed after he was arrested and saying, what are you going to do about it? Um, but you can. So you don't have to, but you can. And it's an interesting way to sort of think about what Jesus is doing in, in these verses. Um, continuing to look at it, um, there are some big ideas going on in this first sermon. Sermon, I suppose. <clears throat> the time is fulfilled. Uh, that phrase in and of itself sort of speaks to this, as I said, eschatological fulfillment or end times prophecy fulfillment. Um, the time is now in which God is showing up uh, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Again, kingdom is not the right word here. It's the traditional word. It's the word we're used to hearing. Unfortunately, we think this is locality rather than action. And so by that, I mean the kingdom of God is not a place. Uh, which is, causes all sorts of problems when we think about it as a place, uh, as if it's a location. In fact, it is a, an action verb, an action word. Uh, the reign and rule of God is at hand. The one who reigns for God is here. Uh, that's the idea being expressed. In other words, he is saying God has shown up. Now is the time to repent and believe in the good news that God is giving. Um, so, uh, 
there's all there's all sorts of things to talk about there, but I'm going to get through the rest of the text um, and maybe come back to it. Maybe not. Um, so then Jesus, uh, or then uh, Mark continues, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he sees Simon and Andrew, uh, his brother, and they're casting a net, and they are fishermen. Now, why is that important? Why is this uh, worth noting? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 16, Jeremiah prophesies that this people of God will be sought by fishermen. And so, not, all right, there's, that is a prophecy. It's worth noting. The problem is the context is radically different. So, Jeremiah, yes, Jeremiah says, God's people will be sought by fishermen. Here we have Jesus calling fishermen to go out and seek the lost sheep of Israel. Um, and so there is that uh, prophecy fulfillment. Uh, one thing to also note is, however, is um, the next verse in that section about the fishermen is that the next people who are sent are hunters uh, who will destroy those who do not listen. So uh, you could sort of apply that maybe to, to the Romans who will destroy the city of Jerusalem and cast out all those who didn't believe in Christ. You're just sort of pushing it. There isn't enough direct ties in the text to sort of say that concretely, uh, but it is worth noting that uh, this prophecy does sort of exist and um, that not only are fishermen called to gather the people of God, uh, but there is judgment that then follows those who reject the fishermen's calling. Um, so that's, that's part of um, why it might be noteworthy of why they're fishermen. Going back to the text, uh, he's going to make them fit, not fishermen, but fishers of men. Uh, he says to them, follow me. Uh, that's all he really says. Or He says, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And that's sufficient. Immediately they will leave their nets and follow him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Um, and immediately he called them, and they left their father with the hired hands and followed him. So we have this call narrative of you know, why, or what's happening, why is it happening, and, and so on. Well, in Mark's gospel, one of the big emphases is what Jesus says comes true um, and, speaks, and he speaks with authority. And so we are to see in this scene with, with uh, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, that when Jesus speaks, people respond. Um, and why do they respond? Well, because Jesus speaks with authority, and it's he is someone worth following when called upon. Um, and one of the, so I was reading uh, some of the commentaries on this text, and one of them pointed out that when we look in Greek literature in the call narratives, or, or when other people are called to follow disciples, rabbis, teachers, philosophers, um, the philosophers or the, the leaders, the teachers, have to sort of make a case um, for why they should be followed. They have to have some sort of dialogue with the person uh, to convince them that they are smart and worthy of being followed and listened to. Um, and yet here we don't have that. So there is this, in a sense, what the commentator was pointing out is that there's this literary tradition of when people are called to follow great teachers, that the teachers make this grand appeal and sort of show off their ability. Yet here, Jesus doesn't do any of that. He simply says, follow me, and they follow. Um, and so Mark is using this as a teaching moment for what kind of person is Jesus. Well, he's different than all the other rabbis and teachers and, and philosophers who have to state their case and, and uh, show you with their, with their eloquence or whatever to, to follow them. Uh, Jesus simply has authority, and his word has authority. Um, now, one of the things I had mentioned um, last week, I think, in the readings with John and uh, Philip and Nathaniel, is that there is sort of this buildup in John's gospel. John is doing something different than Mark in his storytelling, that we sort of see this building up of John the Baptist was talking with Simon and Andrew, and likely with James and John, and and they were all sort of in the same town, hearing the same message. And now that John is gone, um, Jesus is now, or even before John's gone, Jesus is calling them to listen to him and to, and to hear him speaking. And so, so when we put John and Mark next to each other, 
we can see that there was this preemptive knowledge of Peter, or of Simon, Andrew, James, John, had heard John the Baptist preach, had heard Jesus speak um, prior to this moment in the boats. Um, and so does that dampen Mark's message? Well, no, Mark is telling a different story than John, and us having the facts uh, or having different perspectives of how people are called to follow him uh, is different because people come to Christ differently. Um, some will hear the authoritative word of God. Some require long conversations and lots of years of preaching and ministry um, and different things happening in their lives. Uh, so it's not, it's not a contradiction to put Mark next to the Gospel of John and say, well, see, it's different. I'm like, yes, it's different. Um, they're telling two different stories in, in that sense. Um, so back to some of the theology then. Um, well, the other thing to note, why, does, why is Zebedee mentioned? Um, Zebedee is likely mentioned, one, because uh, that's how James is known, James the son of Zebedee versus um, the other James, the James the less, um, as he's called in, in some church history. So you have James the great and James the less. Um, and then uh, it's also noted that James and John came from a family with a little bit of money since they can hire hands to, to fish with them. So James and John are not poor. Um, neither are some of many other of Jesus' disciples like Joseph of Arimathea and likely the women um, and uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha are likely fairly wealthy as well. Um, so that's just a little note that not, not all of the disciples are poor. Um, so uh, back to some of the theology then in 14 and 15, since I said I might mention it. Um, the time is fulfilled. Uh, one of the things to note here when thinking about the fulfillment of Jesus Christ and how he fulfills the Old Testament um, is, I suppose, partially fulfills. Um, and I mean partially fulfills in the way that when Jesus shows up, not every leper is cleansed, not every blind person sees, not every lame person walks, not every deaf person hears. Um, those things happen around Jesus. Jesus heals the blind, heals the lame, heals the sick, um, raises people from the dead, but not all of that happens to all people. And so that's what I mean by partial fulfillment. We should recognize that God's end time prophecies are fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus is the full fulfillment of Scripture, but the fullness of Scripture has not happened through Christ yet. It has begun, and to sort of use that liturgical phrase, a foretaste has occurred. We have received the foretaste of the feast to come, a foretaste of the future that is to come. And so we see Christ in his, so Christ is the fullness of his divine majesty and his glory and the fullness of, uh, of what is promised to us. Uh, but he has not done the fullness of things that have been promised. So, uh, the fulfillment has come in Christ, and he begins his work, but the work is not yet done. Um, and so it's at hand, uh, it's being accomplished, it's beginning to take place. The reign and rule of God is beginning to come into the world, um, but it is not full trumpets blasting, angels coming, all being raised sort of fulfillment. Um, and that's sort of, that's again, when you're talking about holding things in tension, um, the urgency of the future and, and the needs of the present, you have to hold that in tension. You still have to hold um, this, this end times tension in, in, in place too, because you have to figure out, um, you know, there are things that we know now and have now, and there are things not yet given. Um, so now we have forgiveness of sin. Now we have the promise of eternal life, but we don't have eternal life. We are still mortal beings who still experience death. And we still sin, we're still corruptible, we're still uh, fighting uh, temptation. And so there's this now and not yet tension where we know these promised realities, um, 
but yet we live in a present where they, where they don't yet exist in their fullness. Uh, and so what do we do then in this time? Well, we repent and believe. Uh, we repent of our sins. We recognize our, um, our faults and, our hum- and we come in humility before God and we believe the good news that Jesus is proclaiming that he is here to bring deliverance, to bring the good news of forgiveness, life, and, um, and everything else that comes with Christ. Okay, so those are the three texts. Um, and uh, I'll probably be focusing this week on that theme of the urgency of the gospel and the urgency of the mission um, and being called to follow Christ and, and, and sort of the immediately that, uh, that Mark uses here as well as the time coming short that Paul mentions. Uh, so that's the, the work uh, for this week, uh, the words for this week, and the work I have to do. Um, and so uh, I hope you enjoyed these three readings. Hope you got uh, a better understanding of, of what's sort of being contained uh, in these texts. And um, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday or welcoming you back uh, next time for these videos. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks.